Tonight, a fresh emergency bushfire warning in Western Victoria with residents told to act immediately to survive. New South Wales police extend the search for the bodies of murdered couple Luke Davies and Jesse Baird to Goulburn. Former US President Donald Trump wins his fourth consecutive primary over rival Nikki Haley in her home state. And Oppenheimer wins big at the SAG Awards, while Australian Elizabeth Debicki takes home Best Female Actor in a Drama Series for The Crown. Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Meredith Sheehan. An emergency warning has been issued for a bushfire in regional Victoria. Residents of Amphitheatre and Glenogie are being told it's too late to leave and to shelter indoors immediately. In the latest flare-up this weekend, at least six homes have been lost and almost 300 properties have been affected between Raglan and Mount Cole. It comes after the emergency warning for the blaze near Chute, Raglan and Waterloo was downgraded to a watch and act. Rachel Clayton reports. Water bombers attack the fire front near Amphitheatre north of Beaufort. As it continues to burn out of control. Nearby residents have seen at least one home lost. We've seen, uh, yeah, one that definitely went up was just the black smoke, yeah. But local landowner Leon Allen is staying for now. We're pretty confident here. Like, as you can see, we've got a lot of short grass around the paddocks and um, not near the bush, so that's a good thing. Around 550 firefighters are working to contain the fire. Crews from around Victoria have pitched in to help with the effort. Residents are being told not to return home and there are warnings it could be another three weeks until the current fires are extinguished. Inside the fire impacted area of Raglan, some stock is on the move. While these cattle survived the fire, there's little feed around. As communities here continue to count the cost, they are also being warned of difficult days ahead with extremely dangerous conditions expected for many areas next week. We are expecting um, temperatures around 40 and the high 30s. Basically anything west of the Hume um, would be areas of concern for the state. At a community meeting in Beaufort, local incident controller John Rofe is warning nervous residents to prepare for the worst. We have to keep this where it is, that's our aim. Uh, but we're going to be up front and say uh, that may not be successful. We're expecting not only high temperatures, but also uh, wind is expected. And given the hot weather that we have had in recent weeks, a lot of drying has occurred, particularly in the west of the state. A race against time to contain the risks before catastrophic conditions hit on Wednesday. Rachel Clayton, ABC News, Beaufort. There's still no sign of the bodies of Luke Davies and Jesse Baird two days after a New South Wales police officer was charged with their alleged murders. Detectives today expanded their search to the southern Tablelands where divers called in to assist nearly 200 kilometres south of the alleged crime scene. The police commissioner said detectives are working around the clock to find answers and asked the community for patience. Bag after bag, police collect more evidence from an eastern Sydney home, the scene of an alleged double homicide. Today's seized items fill a car boot, but police still haven't found Jesse Baird and Luke Davies. My wife and I actually ran into uh, Jesse and Luke only a, a week or so ago. I mean, they both seem so happy, um, in love. It was at this terrace, rented by Jesse, that police found a large volume of blood and a bullet on Wednesday. Ballistic testing allegedly revealed it came from a police firearm. On Friday, Constable Bo Lamar Condon, Jesse's ex-boyfriend, turned himself in at Bondi Police Station and was charged with two counts of murder. Detectives say he's offered no assistance in locating the bodies. The investigation has taken police from Sydney up to Newcastle and today they expanded their search south to Goulburn. Questions are expected to be raised about the force's firearms policies and mental health assessments of officers. No doubt that police investigation 
Commission and subsequent investigations uh, will put forward recommendations if they are needed to change in the way in which uh, we operate in that space. Should it surface that there's additional needs and additional demand, then of course we'll consider that on its merits. Dozens of mourners have left flowers for the couple outside Jessie's home in Paddington. The police commissioner is urging the community to be patient as detectives try to determine exactly what happened to the two young men. This happening right around Mardi Gras when it's a celebration of gay life, it just hits that much harder. The most difficult thing is just to comprehend what has actually happened and especially at the moment as well, uh, not knowing where Jessie and Luke are. A shaken community, desperate for answers. Helena Burke, ABC News, Sydney. A 30-year-old security guard has died after allegedly being punched in the head at a pub in Sydney South. Police say the assault happened early this morning after a patron was asked to leave following an altercation. A man has been charged over the incident. Laying flowers for a well-known hotel security guard allegedly killed while doing his job. It's massive, it's massive. I've seen a lot of violence here, but I've never seen anyone get killed. He's there to do a job, and um, I don't think uh, when you go to work you should have anything like that happen, and you should be a lot safer than what you are. Emergency services were called to the Royal Hotel in Sutherland around 2 o'clock this morning. They found a 30-year-old security guard unconscious outside the pub. First responders attempted to resuscitate him, but he died at the scene. It's just a tragedy all round for the families involved, the people at the hotel, for emergency services. There is no winners in this situation. Witnesses told police the security guard, who was from overseas, was punched in the head by a patron who was asked to leave after an altercation. That patron, a 31-year-old man, has been charged with assault occasioning death under the state's coward punch legislation. The guy was tanked and he's upset a whole bunch of people. Security blokes tried to shut him down and lost his life from it. The manager of the hotel did not wish to speak on camera but says the business is devastated. He's handed over CCTV footage from the pub which police say captured the entire incident. It is uh, very crucial to our investigation. The 31-year-old has been refused bail to face local court tomorrow. Ethan Ricks, ABC News, Sydney. The biggest university reforms in a generation. That's what's been proposed by a government review of the sector released today. Everything from research funding to more than doubling the number of students on campus has been proposed. But the government is yet to commit or reveal how they'd pay for it all. Jade Smith always loved learning, but grew up thinking the ivory towers of university life were out of reach. The idea of university was something that was really unattainable and quite fantastical to some degree. Um, I didn't know anyone who had been to university. The campuses of the future may not be so lonely. The government's proposing meeting Australia's skills challenges by lifting the number of university places available from 860,000 today to 1.8 million in 2050. In the decades ahead, we need 80% of our workforce, not just to have finished school, but to have gone to uni or to TAFE with equity targets to ensure more new students are from poorer backgrounds, regional areas and First Nations families. We've got to smash down an invisible barrier that stops a lot of kids from poor families and our outer suburbs and the regions from getting a crack at university in the first place. Education charities welcome this, along with potential changes to student debt and extra support to help new students adjust. We'd love to see that sort of support embedded in campus. That is what this is all about. There's plenty of homework to be done to find a way to pay for the 47 recommendations in the 400-page report. This is bigger than one budget. This is a plan not for the next few years, but for the next few decades. I think what it really reveals is that higher education in Australia has been chronically underfunded now for decades. While many universities welcomed the plan, a proposal to have the wealthiest campuses pay $5 billion in tax to contribute to less well-off institutions drew an immediate backlash from the leaders who'd be forced to cough up. I think it's odd that the revenue measure would be to tax the universities that have been starved of funding. The system needs more money. Back on campus, Jade Smith is gearing up for her masters and would love to see more inclusive campuses. It's been an incredibly fantastic experience. Sandstone for all. 
Connor Duffy, ABC News. Heavy rain in North Queensland has started to ease, but the risk of flash flooding remains. Tully, south of Cairns, recorded more than 400 millimetres over the weekend, cutting off the Bruce Highway. Further south in Uramo, houses and businesses were also impacted by floodwaters. More rain is forecast for central Queensland in coming days. There will be some risk of heavy rainfall around, uh, but quite a lot lower risk uh, than there has been over the last few days in northern Queensland. Uh, however, potentially some places could see rainfall, uh, localised rainfall in the 50 to 100 millimetre range. Donald Trump is marching towards the Republican nomination for President of the United States after a win in his party's fourth nomination contest. The result was declared just minutes after polls closed in South Carolina. His challenger, Nikki Haley, has vowed to stay in the race, but looks unlikely to stop Mr Trump from securing the nomination. Who is the next President of the United States? Notching up another victory. This was a little sooner than we anticipated. It was an even bigger win than we anticipated. Voters in South Carolina apparently undaunted by the slew of criminal charges the former president is facing. I know where Donald Trump took us in the last four years of his term and decided to go back that direction. So. One exit poll of 2,000 voters here finding more than 60% would still support Mr Trump even if convicted of a crime, with a similar percentage doubting Joe Biden won the previous election. But we're Trump supporters, right? Both of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Always have been? Always have been, yeah. Nikki Haley found some support on her home turf performing a little better than polls had predicted. Yeah, I voted for Nikki Haley. Donald Trump is a crazy person. She's the person for the job. But it wasn't enough. The state's former governor defiant nonetheless. I'm not giving up this fight when a majority of Americans disapprove of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Nikki Haley vowing to continue fighting at least until Super Tuesday in early March. So much of that decision is about, you know, what does the money look like? Do you have enough money to keep going? You know, does she feel like she's making an important case? Maybe she's thinking about kind of what's going to happen in 2028 or 2032. Behind the bravado, there's disappointment for Nikki Haley. This loss in her home state, further proof of the grip that Donald Trump has on the Republican Party. Probably time for her to move out. I think it's time for the party to unite. Nikki Haley has done just enough here to fight on a little longer. We love you all. God bless you all. Against what increasingly all. feels like the inevitability of Donald Trump's nomination. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Charleston, South Carolina. Ukraine's president has called on his country to keep fighting as the nation marks two years at war with Russia. World leaders, soldiers and civilians stepped out to pay their respects to the fallen on the anniversary as Ukrainian troops prepare for another tough year on the front lines. Bullets are flying, smoke grenades are going off. Ukrainian troops are on the move and the enemy is close by. But today, this is only a training exercise. These soldiers are finishing a six-week course in the UK. Now I'm training here, but from the first days of uh, full-scale invasion, I was on the front line. This is taking place at a secret location in the east of England. It's being led by Australian soldiers who are involved in a multinational effort to upskill Ukraine's troops. The skills that are, are being developed and uh, for the armed forces of Ukraine members are things from um, small arms training with their individual weapons, uh, first aid and care of the combat casualty, and uh, tactics training in rural, urban and trench environments. The Australian approach to combat marksmanship is, is really powerful, really strong. And I think particularly if you look at the nature of trench warfare, where a lot of that fighting is really up close and visceral, really good weapon handling and effective combat skills is absolutely vital.
It's a poignant moment for many here as they reflect on the two-year anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. I really miss my family, and but the things we do, we do so our children do not have to handle this in future, so they don't see all this pain. About 35,000 Ukrainians have been trained here in England since the 2022 full-scale invasion, ranging from ordinary civilians with no military experience to more senior soldiers who are learning how to be leaders of their battalion. Some here are heading home for the front line. Ukraine is entering its third year at war in a difficult position. Russia occupies about a fifth of its territory and Kyiv needs more financial aid, weapons and ammunition. Any normal person wants the war to end, but none of us will allow Ukraine to end. That's why to the words end of war, we always add on our terms. That's why the word peace always goes with fair. Western leaders, including the Canadian and Italian Prime Minister, were in Kyiv in a show of solidarity. Around the world, the Ukrainian diaspora and their supporters marked the two-year milestone. Slava, slava. Soldiers remember their fallen and vow to fight on for victory. Isabella Higgins, ABC News. U.S. and British forces have carried out airstrikes on more than a dozen Houthi targets in Yemen. The Pentagon says the strikes are directed at underground weapons, missile storage facilities and air defence systems. It's the latest round of fighting against the Iran-backed Houthi group, which continues to attack ships in the Red Sea in support of Palestinians in Gaza. Almost daily strikes by the U.S. alone have so far failed to halt the attacks, which are disrupting global supply chains. The body of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been returned to his mother following his sudden death in prison last week. Family and supporters had been fighting to have his body released, even visiting the remote facility where he died. A spokesperson for Mr Navalny's family says it's not yet known whether authorities will allow a funeral to be held as people continue to lay flowers at memorials. The Russian opposition leader died of unexplained causes in an Arctic penal colony where he was serving a 30-year prison sentence. The Screen Actors Guild Awards have been handed out in Los Angeles where three female Australian stars were up for major prizes. Elizabeth Debicki kicked off her shoes before accepting the prize of Best Female Actor in a Drama Series for her portrayal of Princess Diana um, in The Crown. She beat fellow Australian Sarah really Snook, who was nominated for her role in Succession. Australia's Margot Robbie missed out on her prize for Barbie. The Best Female Lead went instead to Lily Gladstone, the first Indigenous person to win several high-profile acting awards. The blockbuster Oppenheimer took away many of the main awards, including Best Ensemble Cast. The SAG Awards are voted by members of the Actors' Union. Now to tonight's special report. Now, most Australians don't have to think twice about getting from A to B, but for people with disability, using transport services requires meticulous planning and things often go wrong. Fed up with what they see as a lack of action, some have taken matters into their own hands. Advocates are calling for decision makers to make accessibility reforms more of a priority. I've had trains drive off and here. Been dropped off in a place where it took me three hours to get back home. We feel disrespected. We feel like a second class citizen. These are stories from people trying to get on with life. The ABC has heard hundreds of accounts from people with disability struggling with transport. They want you to know that it doesn't matter what disability you have, the mode of transport you take or where you live, getting around is harder than it should be. Neil first became a quadruple amputee after contracting meningococcal. Transport's been difficult for Neil to navigate, including on a family trip to Malaysia last year. Halfway through the plane trip, uh, the hostess came up and said, we don't have a, um, a, you know, a tube for you to get off the plane. So the option was that I would be carried down the steps. The same thing happened arriving back in Melbourne, 
Only this time, safety laws prevented him from being carried off. The family were left on board for two hours after other passengers disembarked as the airport scrambled to find a solution. I was pretty disappointed in the administration. For God's sake, they should have done something quicker about it. In a statement, Melbourne Airport said it has been upgrading its facilities, but admitted more accessibility improvements could be made. Advocates say transport systems as a whole have been letting people with disability down. It fails because there's poor services, there's lack of consistency throughout, not just buses, taxis, aviation, trams. All levels of government hold responsibilities relevant to air travel. Public transport sits with the states and territories, though the federal government sets accessibility legislation for them to follow. A review into the aviation sector is underway, while an audit of public transport accessibility standards is currently with ministers. People with disability want them applied and strengthened. If those standards aren't complied with and not enforced, what's the point of having them? The federal government says there has been improvements in accessibility and investment in recent years, but concedes people with disabilities still face issues. It says it's committed to listening to the experiences of people with disability to further tackle discrimination. Meanwhile, some people with disability are taking matters into their own hands. Oh, so one minute and we're three minutes early. Okay, that's cool. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Santiago Velasquez is blind and an electrical engineer. He's created an app he hopes will help. Halo would allow people to notify a bus or train driver about their pick-up and drop-off locations and what supports they have, such as a ramp. That information then goes to the driver via an alert, so the user doesn't have to advocate for themselves. The best impact that we're aiming for with Halo is to give people the ability to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Straight. Straight. Santiago developed the app after a frustrating incident on the way to university. I wasn't able to sit an exam because a bus left my guide dog and I behind. I arrived late, they said, it's too late, you got to repeat this unit, sucks to be you. List. The 27-year-old is in talks about trialling his app. His message to transport services everywhere is simple. Transport should work for everybody, right? That's the whole idea behind it. It's public transport and it shouldn't be hard. In the NRL, the Eels have defeated the Titans in the final game of the pre-season challenge. It marks the end of trials as players and fans look forward to the season opener in Las Vegas next Sunday. The final trial games before the real deal begins saw experienced players return and the next generation shine. Parramatta's inclusion of Mitch Moses and Clint Gutherson improved the side, holding off a late Titans comeback and scoring five tries to defeat them 26 to 16. That was lovely rugby league by Parramatta. On the other side of the world this morning, English Super League champions the Wigan Warriors defeated NRL Premiers the Penrith Panthers 16 to 12 in the World Cup challenge in Wigan. Down by four, Penrith's Taylor May looked to have snatched the victory in the final seconds, but his try was disallowed, making it the fourth time the Panthers have lost the contest. Back home last night, the St George Illawarra Dragons captain Ben Hunt led his side to its first win under new coach Shane Flanagan, defeating the West Tigers in Mudgee. Hunt's classy stint included two tries in his 62 minutes, adding to the Dragons' convincing 34-18 win. With the pre-season challenge now wrapped up, the NRL season kicks off in Las Vegas next Sunday. Anthea Moody, ABC News. The Matildas have all but secured a spot at the Paris Games after a 3-0 victory over Uzbekistan in their Olympic playoff series. In freezing conditions in Tashkent, the Australians struggled early without injured captain Sam Kerr. Wide with Catley, looks up and crosses, Ford is there and that's three. 
A late goal-scoring blitz moves the Matildas closer to securing a Paris Games berth in July, having beaten Uzbekistan 3-0 in the first leg of their Olympic playoff series. And the banks have broken and the goals are flooding in. We had to um, have some patience, but this game here was important for us to get a good result to set up the second game, so hopefully more goals than what we had tonight. The Matildas will be looking to avoid another slow start, as was in snowy Tashkent, when the sides face off again in a few days. Really should have done better. There were some technical mistakes today, uh, and we need to admit that we left way too many goals on the table today. I mean, we, our conversion rate must have been really bad. In their first match without injured skipper Sam Kerr, the world-class striker's absence was glaring, with Australia kept scoreless for more than an hour. Well, how did that not go in? Debutante Caitlin Torby wore Kerr's number 20. It belongs to her and no one's going to be taking that from her, um, but yeah, hopefully she was OK watching it. Veteran Michelle Heyman stepped up, breaking the deadlock in the 72nd minute. To come on and score a goal, it's a dream come true. Mary Fowler doubled the advantage. Clinical, individual finish. While Caitlin Ford's header sealed the win moments later. <laughs> Australia boasts hosting rights for Wednesday's sold-out Game 2 in Melbourne. I'm really excited. I really enjoy being back home and getting to be with the, the fans and, and have them um, watching us in the stands, so really looking forward to it. Worlds away from frosty Uzbekistan with a sweltering 34 degrees forecast. Chloe Hart, ABC News. Looking ahead to tomorrow's forecast for the capital cities, in Brisbane there'll be a possible shower developing. There's also a chance of a late shower about Sydney. Canberra will be mostly sunny, a possible morning shower in Melbourne. Hobart will be cloudy, there'll be some cloud about in Adelaide as well. Some cloud clearing in Perth and Darwin is expecting showers and a possible storm reaching a top of 32 degrees. And that's the latest from ABC News. Remember, you can keep up to date at news.abc.net.au and on ABC iView. I'm Meredith Sheehan. Stay with us. Back Roads is coming up next.